Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. In this video, we will explain the subtarsal approach. Uh, in order to understand this video, you must see our previous video about subsidiary approach. As you know that uh, many incision techniques are available for the treatment of orbitozygomatic fractures. The major difference between them is the level at which the incision is placed in the skin of the eyelid and the level at which the muscle is transected to expose the orbital septum or periosteum. Uh, one incision has not been clearly demonstrated to be superior to another. Many factors must be considered and also the advantages and disadvantages. Converse uh, originally described the subsidiary approach to the orbit in 1944. He and others have also advocated a subtarsal variation of this approach. Uh, overall, however, it seems that the subtarsal approach produces less risk for vertical shortening of the lid and a decreased incidence of scleral show and atropion compared with the subsidiary approach whereas the amount of edema is higher in the subtarsal approach and also the incidence of noticeable scar, though still barely noticeable in the absence of complications. So in balance, this rate of noticeable scar is quite acceptable when compared with the rates of scleral show and or ectropion with the subsidiary approach. Additional in advantage include generous exposure and in some hands decrease operative time to access the fracture site. That is uh, almost 15 minutes for a subsidiary approach as compared to the eight minutes uh, for the subtarsal approach. It means that a subtarsal approach uh, can be completed uh, within an eight minutes. It means that the incision and then the dissection is completed in eight minutes. Uh, second important point is that uh, lower the incision is made on the eyelid, the lower the risk of scleral show and or ectropion, but more uh, noticeable the scar. Therefore, we believe the optimal transcutaneous approach should be as near the eyelid margin as possible to minimize scarring, but far away enough to minimize scleral show and ectropion. So for subtarsal incision, uh, you must be restricted in the subtarsal area. So you should be closer to the uh, lid margin should not be far away from the uh, lid margin. Uh, subtarsal approach uh, with uh, uh, a post-operative frost suture will reduce the uh, scleral show and our ectropion, so it benefits, makes it a reasonable uh, compromise. Uh, and for average now, oral and maxillofacial surgeon who treats orbital injuries infrequently, the subtarsal approach will prove to be a better choice when access to the orbital rim and or the orbital floor is needed. It is simple, predictable, effective, and safe. Now we will explain the steps for a subtarsal approach. Uh, protection of uh, the globe can be achieved with the tarso uh, First of all is to identify and evaluate uh, the skin creases. Uh, marking of the incision line is plain in a natural crease at a level below the inferior margin of the lower tarsus. If edema is present, the direction of the skin creases uh, is not available. In such cases, so the contralateral eyelid determines the direction and position of the creases. Or the incision is made approximately 5 to 7 mm from the lower eyelid margin following an inferior lateral cant approximately the normal uh, subtarsal crease. Uh, so some patients have two or more subtarsal.
tarsal lid creases superior to the orbital rim. Uh, either uh, crease can be used in a, a trauma setting, uh, whereas uh, the superior crease would be a better choice for the aesthetic patient. It means that the subtarsal incision uh, should be as close to the uh, tarsal plate as feasible in patients with the lower eyelid creases. As we said, that the uh, crease closest to the tarsal plate should be chosen. Um, and further, the same rule apply in the younger patient without creases on the lower lid. Uh, so uh, the incision is optimally placed uh, just inferior to the tarsal plate, that is uh, 5 to 7 mm below the lid margin. Uh, uh, but uh, however, uh, the incision is diagonally oriented and starts medially uh, about 2 to uh, 3 mm, 2 to 3 mm below the lid, lid margins and courses in a lateral uh, cardinal direction. Remember that the subciliary incision is almost about uh, 2 to uh, 3 mm below the lid margin where a subtarsal incision is in the subtarsal area and almost it is 5 to 7 mm below the lid margin. So next, the lower lid uh, may be uh, infiltrated uh, with a, a local anesthetic uh, containing the uh, vasoconstrictor. Uh, so uh, after infiltration with 2% uh, lignocaine with epinephrine, the incision is made along the lower border of the uh, tarsal plate uh, in the uh, subtarsal uh, fold. Uh, so the incision is, as we said, is diagonally oriented. Uh, here you can see also that it starts medially about two to three mm below the lid margin and courses in a in a, a lateral cardinal direction. Uh, so the orbicularis muscle is exposed. Uh, the muscle is then elevated laterally uh, from the orbital septum and a, a slit, uh, a small slit is opened uh, using a, a scissors. Um, through this opening, orbicularis muscle is undermined in the preceptal uh, space. The scissors can also be used for sub uh, orbicular blunt dissection with, spread, with spreading motions as we discussed in our previous video. Uh, uh, then the muscle is uh, separated from uh, laterally uh, to the, um, from uh, laterally to the medially along the course of the muscle fibers leaving the orbital septum intact. Uh, the muscle is divided uh, in the direction of its fibers a few millimeter uh, below the skin incision again to prevent uh, scar inversion. Uh, so here you can see this is the skin incision and here is the muscle incision. So it is below, it is a, a step uh, um, will be placed uh, here. So uh, this step uh, uh, also preserves all of the innervation to the uh, pre-tarsal orbicularis uh, and maintains a band of pre-tarsal orbicularis muscle. Because the pre-tarsal muscle is not disturbed in this case, uh, so the involuntary blink reflex is undisturbed and the pre-tarsal lid fullness associated with the youth, youthful eyelid is preserved. The direction proceeds in inferiorly in a pre-septal uh, uh, sub-orbicular uh, plane until the infra-orbital bony margin is re reached. Here you can see uh, it is the dissection proceeded inferiorly. You can see the infra-orbital bony area. So the infraorbital rim is directed in a supraperiosteal plane. Uh, then we will continue the subperiosteal dissection down to the uh, level of the infraorbital rim in preceptal uh, plane. Uh, 
to gain access to the orbit, the periosteum over the infraorbital rim is in, incised, starting laterally at a level below the rim. In both the subtarsal and subciliary incisions, it is important to incise the periosteum on the interior surface of the rim away from the orbital septum a few millimeter below the rim to avoid vertical lid shortening. Infraorbital rim is exposed uh, superiorly to for the subsequent periorbital dissection. Here you can see. So the periorbital dissection is continued to expose any fracture of the orbital walls in the inferomedio lateral circumference of the uh, bony cavity. Uh, after repair of the orbital walls, the subtarsal approach is closed in a layer starting with the periosteum. Next, the orbicularis muscle layer is uh, re-approximated uh, as shown here. Uh, intraoperative appearance after closure of the orbicularis muscle, you can see in this picture, and uh, then uh, skin is closed uh, with running or interrupted sutures. Suspensory suture or uh, frost suture is placed as we uh, discuss in the previous video about the subciliary approach. Thank you.